So for the second case, it's about Campylobacter. I can disclose that much right now. Um, I have the data. When I got it, I got it as three different text files. And the first part of the second case is basically to get that data set into something that can be used for an analysis. So the trials contains every single broiler flock, I mean chickens that are meant for consumption, um, slaughtered over a roughly 10 year period in Denmark. So we're talking about millions and millions and millions of chickens. But we don't want to look at them individually. We want to look at how can we, what can we do in order to explain the seasonality. Because what happens is, or I mean, at least historically, it's better today, is that during the winter time we have a small proportion of flocks that are positive, so-called prevalent. Whereas in summertime it grows up to be quite a few more, up to like four out of five flocks are labeled as positive. So what is the purpose of this is, can we, by looking at the climate, say something about what is actually driving this? And thereby get some insights that we can use when we talk to biologists and say, well, what is then happening? And then can we use that information to actually fix the problem? So, of course, you're welcome to fix the problem, but I'm not entirely sure that you will. Some may get close to it. Um, so that, that's the, the part of it. So the first one here, you have some columns, various columns, and, very, and I made a recipe as to how to progress. You have this when the case is open, but getting through this recipe, there's a lot of things that you may not have seen before. So therefore, I have a few hints showing how things work that you can use. So that's one part. And the other part is, since you now have a lot of different numerical predictors, what you've done in the first case is to look at a lot of factors and sometimes in combination with a single numerical predictor. But what happens when you have interactions between numerical predictors? I mentioned it last week, but I know mentally for some it's a long time ago. Am I right? So, for the first part, I just need to have some, in this case, some numbers, A, and I just take the numbers from 3 to 5, just to do something. So, one thing is matching, there's also a function called merge, that can do more advanced things. Um, so, if you try to find which elements in A are in B and which, uh, where are they, then you get an NA if an element in A is not in B, and if it is in B, it will give you what is there. So this tree here says that there's a 5 here, and 5 is the fifth ele uh, third element in B. And if I do it reverse, then I get, well, the tree, the first tree, in this case is the 18th number, the first two, is here, and the first one is there. But there may be multiple ones, so it only gives you the first occurrence. That's just one thing to be aware of. You can also check if things are in or out, just to say, is this in the other list or not? So that's basically saying, do I have an NA up here or not? To test if B is an A, and in this case, all elements, say 3, 4, and 5, they are in the sample I got from the other one. So that is just some logical operators to figure out how to kind of merge things manually if you want to do it. There's a function called merge that can do things if you can control it. You can also ask about the unique values. Now, when you have unique values, and that is fewer than the total number of values, then you can ask for which ones are duplicated. So what happens here is you do not get the first time a number or a variable occurs. It's not duplicated. If it 
occurs again, then it's duplicated. So it will return true for whenever it comes again. Let's go back and look at A. So this here, the third element, that's an 8, and we already had an 8 before that. Of course, we can negate that, and negation is just an ampersand. So then I can got, get the unique numbers is A of those that are not duplicated in A. That's the same as unique. Now, you will also have some text strings that you can play with to some extent. These are just some words. If you want a substring, you just say what is the first and last character you want. In this case, I want nine characters, including the space. That's these are. You can also paste things together. So if I want to have a sum in between, take the first one to nine characters, and then take ele character 11 to 16. So that gives me, I am omitting the space in, in between there. And then it uses a separator each time there is something, a new variable. So here I have paste of three parts, one, two, and three. And then we'll put a se the separator you define in every, in between every place. The default is just to have a space. Now, if you have, in this case, just something I want to create some emails, I have a vector of elements. In the first one, I only had one text string, then one text string, and then one text string. Now I have a text string, I have a vector of things. Let me first do it without the collapse out here. So what I get here is a vector of nine for each of these numbers here. I get a text string out. Now what I want to do is that I want to be able to copy this text string directly to my email client. So I want to have a semicolon rather than having all these quotes and semicolons things. So I want to collapse all these vectors by a semicolon and a space just to find my way through it. So then I have it like that. So now if I want to send an email to those guys, I won't. I have it all there. So just to say that paste is rather flexible. I don't know how many of you work with regular expressions and stuff like that before. I assume only a few, I saw that. Um, so grep, what it's doing is basically looking to see if you can find a pattern in some text strings. And that can be done in many ways. Um, so I could look at all the files that are in this particular folder that I'm in. And if I do that, those are the files. And I want to know which of these contains a So the first, second, fourth, and fifth contains R. No surprise in this case, to just to give you a quick example. And then here it gives you the index out, but you can also say that what I want is the value here. So then I get the file names of all those that are containing R. You can also do a So if you go want to know more about how to do weird things like this, look up the grep function. There's a lot of other functions, I think eight or so in the help page for that. Uh, there's also grep L that gives you just the logical. So then you get a vector of the length of the index and then you can use it as a logical thing rather than just giving you the numbers. Depending on how you're indexing, sometimes it's li nice to have a logical vector to index with. Sometimes it's nice to just have the row numbers. If you have the row, have the logic here, and you want the row numbers, now I should probably go back. Then you can ask for which. and then it'll give me the original answer in a different way. 
I think I mentioned this last week as well. Whenever you have dates, they can be formatted in many different ways. And that is the case for you guys soon. So there are many functions to handle dates. One is as date. You can also use, I think in the exercise text, I use the POSIX as a comment. Each of these have different pros and cons. Um, right now, I'll just show you one. So as date, if you have a date in a particular format, what you do is that you specify the format that you want to use. Percent %m for month, percent %year for a two-digit year, use uppercase y if you have a four-digit year, and percent %d for day within month, right? So you can format things any way you like. This will be treated as December 27th, 1998. You can also just have it as numbers. Basically, when you say percent %m, it takes two characters and treat that as a number. Likewise for percent %year, the following two, and the last two in this case. So you just need those six characters to code it. And you can flip the order however you like. You just have to figure out what the input format is. Now, if you take a date like this one, like the first one, and you ask for it as a numeric, then you get a number, which means you can also subtract dates. What have... Oh, okay, that should not run right now. Anyways, there may be some windows popping up right now. It's a backup script running. So, if you take this as date, you can also have some other date. Let me just take that one there and then subtract. Let me take the 24th. So, time difference is three days. So, you can get everything out as a number of days difference because they are internally, when you use as date, you're looking at integer days since January 1st. 1960 or 1970, I always forget. Uh, So-called Julian dates. When is it? 70. 70, okay. January 1st, 1970. So just so the number 10,587 is not just a random number. Another function that can help you to do things with time is the strip time. But you can look at that if you want to know. I mean, all the things that is in there is if you want to use other characters here for taking other things out, that's where you get the information from. So that was just some very small examples for things you can do, handling text strings, doing dates, indexing, matching, and so forth. So that was one thing I wanted to do. Another thing is, now we discussed a few things last week, namely if you have interactions between two continuous variables. What does it mean? It means that the slope for one variable here depends on the value of the other. So the slope for this variable, say, is increasing like that when you increase this one over here. So everything is straight lines along the coordinate system in both directions. So as an example, I'll just simulate some data. X1 and X2, they're uniformly distributed, independent of one another to start with. And then I have a linear model here, including an interaction here as just a product of X1 and X2. And just looking, showing a pass plot, this is what we have. So one thing that is nice here is that the x1 and x2 are totally independent. So there's no correlation whatsoever here. So we're spanning the full region, so we can probably trust our model in the full region. And what you see out here is, well, this mask showing that there's definitely something happening, but it's quite difficult to say what is actually happening from just this one. Except that when x2 is small and when x1 is small, then they are kind of together the points in there. So let's just fit a linear model. 
You've done that many times so far, so this should be easy for you guys. Let's look at what we get out. So what we have here is an intercept. We have a slope in x1. That means when x2 is zero, this is a slope for x1. And, and reverse, when x1 is zero, this is a slope for x2. And then that is the interaction. So that is how the slope is changing when you go, when you change one. And that goes both ways. Because it's both, if you, for a given value of x1, how do, is it dependent on x2? Then you just take the given value of x1, multiply it by 0.5, and add that, and then you have that slope. So, how do we present this? Again, let's look at the data that we can have here. Take a vector of x1 values for prediction and x2 values, just stepping 0.5 each time. And then I'll expand the a grid here to get all possible combinations of x1 and x2. And then I'll, at first, I won't do a prediction interval. First, I'll just show you the mean value structure. And now what I have here is first a column of x1s, a column of x2s, and then the corresponding fit. But in order to plot it, it is a two-dimensional or three-dimensional thing you have here, so I need to kind of flip it out to be a matrix, at least for some functions. So what I'll do here is I will Make it a matrix, take the fits, and I'll take, since they are ordered so that you have x1, each time you have one level of that, then you're just changing x2, then, then x2 is fixed. So that's how you want to split the matrix. You want the first, how many levels are, how many values there are in x1, that's the number of rows you want, given the, the order of the data. I don't, ah, I should not show this. I'll just make an image showing what it looks like. Looks like this. It's not that informative because there's no color scale, no legend, no water whatsoever. You can also do a contour. There you can at least see the axis and you can see the, what the levels are. I personally like to combine the two where you just say that I want to add the contour plot. The typical thing that you do that makes this does not, not, not work the way you want it to do I'm expecting this to happen. First of all, make sure that the predictions for x1 and x2 are not vectors of the same length, because when you do the image plot, it's, then it's too easy to just have the wrong, if you just flip them wrong. That has happened to me a number of times, because what is the order of things? It is just the first one and then the second one, so it's the one that corresponds to the rows, and then the one that corresponds to the columns. But if you make sure they have different lengths, then you get a warning or an error if you try to make that plot. And then one thing that I do like, maybe this in this case is a little bit too busy, um, but that is to show you where all the person, all, where do we have points? Where do we have information? Maybe I should make these points smaller character expansion. Oh, let's go back. And just make some small dots. So then you can find your way around. And maybe you want the contour here. I think you have the label expansion. How big should the label expansion be? Now I did it on top of the other, so let's do it from the beginning. Make them very large and friendly numbers just to show that you can play with that so it's readable. Some really much like to do 3D plots. I'll just show you one way, there's many ways of doing this. Um, personally, yes, they're nice to look at, but they're extremely hard to interpret. Here you can look at, actually get the numbers out. But I'll just show you, you can 
show all the points as a cloud in there. Oh yeah, I can see there's somewhat spanning, but it's very difficult to see anything in detail. I can also present the fit as a wireframe. I think that actually looks somewhat nice. What you can see there, it may be a little bit difficult, but if you look along each of these lines here, they're actually straight lines. So when you're looking around here, what happens is that you have straight lines that are just changing the slope, both in one direction and in the other direction, as I said initially. Everything, every line you're following is straight. Of course, you can have it with colors, then it's easy to find your way through. What I recommend is also, instead of having just arrows on the axis, to actually put the numbers in there so you can actually read what is there. In this case, where you can, you can pretty much find your way through, so you can actually read the numbers in there. But it's not so easy. It's nice for illustration, but I do prefer at least images and contour plots are e generally easier to interpret. That's my personal view. Um, the lattice package also have, you can say, a default level plot that's similar to the image. You don't have to pre-manipulate the data as such, you just give the data as the data frame you made from the prediction, so it's actually quite easy to make this. By default, it contains the uh, color legend out there, so it's fairly nice. This is just showing where I predicted everywhere. So these are all the points where I made the predictions. And then the contour plot that comes from here. You can do something different than just the panel that actually Y plot out here to plot something different than just the contour. So it's just saying that you can do where weird things if you like to code, but you can also use some default things that just works. Now, one thing that I've been trying to say many times is always m include a measure of uncertainty. In this case, it's quite difficult to communicate it. There are basically, I would say, two ways of doing it. Um, I'll show you one now. If you look at the fit here, it only contains the fit, but if we do the usual thing to get the prediction interval up here, that of course works for any model. So now we have three additional common columns. It's the fit, the lower and upper. Now the structure here is a little bit odd when you at first look at it. I'll give you that. So what I did was I add, added an extra element to the data frame that I called EINT. But that also contains, that is actually a data frame itself. So if I look at this, the names of data, that only has four names. But the last one has three columns. I could have done it differently. I could have just made a C bind of what was there and then the predictions then I would have it as six columns in one data frame. Just a coding thing. Um, the other one may be nicer in practice, but this was how I made it the first time and then, yeah, got along with that. So what I will do now is that I will take the first two columns here. I want to look at the lower and upper levels here. So I'll take all the rows that I have and just put them underneath one another the first two columns, and then I will take the interval for the first half of the new data frame, I'll take the lower bound, and for the last half, I'll take the upper bound. And then I add an extra column that is lower or upper, pretty much as just a character, but in, think of it as a factor. And I say each of them should be replicated n times for the lower and n times for the upper. So now I have this data frame for this value, combination x1, x2, I have this interval for the lower bound and further down I have the similar one for the upper bound for that point. And then I'll make the wireframe again. And I, what I do different from before is that I have groups here, 
have the same model here, but then they just say the groups is this factor here. So they will make one wireframe for each group, each data of the group. This is one of the places where, oh yeah, I can see that I have two planes, but how much can you say about this lower plane? It's below the other plane. <laughs> yes? I'll show you. That's the one code I did not write, but I'll fix it. <laughs> so what you can do here is that you can rotate and say, where do you want to look from? And then I made just a rotation so you can see how they're sitting there in curves in various ways. When you look at, I mean, in other directions than just the straight lines, I mean, in any direction, this is a, a second order polynomial. So, but again, it's very difficult to say much about it, right? Um, and I think when you have structures like this, please do present the mean value and then do something different to represent the uncertainty. And it may be, very, it's sometimes very difficult to do it in an appropriate way. Um, so, whereas so far I've been very strict as on to always do this, there will be cases here where it's virtually impossible to say something meaningful in a two-dimensional plot. What you want to do is probably in a 2D plot. Could be, but an image as such is also a 3D plot. But what would be a meaningful, now what we looked at before, we looked at, let me take this one. These were our predictions. Right? From before. Now, what could be a measure of the uncertainty? It could be instead of using the fit here as the response. So these here are the, I hope I can use this one, expected. Did work. Now, what is it that we want, as a measure of uncertainty, what is it that we want? We want to have, I'll just do the identity of fit minus, and then we have to look at the names again. The other one is called int for interval. Int, and if you subtract the lower bound. Let's see if this works. It did not like me. It's because that is an that is an element of this one. And the question is, how do I? Maybe I should change the code up where I said I would change it. Uh, oh, I could make it work. I want the second column because. In this int here has three columns. The lower bound is the this one here. So what I have here is the fit minus the lower bound. So that's the width of the prediction interval. That's plus minus this is what is your uncertainty. In this case, if you look at the scale out here, it's very, very close. Why is that? Can you see that? First of all, it's it's minimum in the, in the center, and then it grows the further you get away. But why is that? You can actually see it here. It's between you have a full coverage of X and Y. Everything is uniformly distributed everywhere. So we have a lot of information everywhere. Yes? Uh, 
Yeah, the, that, that is also fine. Just write what you do. So, the other, so that's the that's the span of the 95% interval. This is just how far does it predict away from the from the mean. You could also divide it. Yes, you can. You can also if you divide this in here. Now I have to be careful a little bit, but we can do it an intelligent way. What I could do would be to go up and find my predict function here. My model is called LM1. So what happens here is that this is a 95% interval. So I can take and divide this by the how many degrees of freedom do I have in my model. Let me just go down here and do it on its own. This LM1, if you just do a summary of it, I won't do that. But I will look at degrees of freedom for the residual. So I have 396 degrees of freedom for my residual. So if I take a t, a quantile in the t distribution with degrees of freedom equals to this, and I want the 97.5. So this is how much I multiply on the standard deviation. Right? Does that make sense? So if I take a t distribution with and look at the 97.5 quant percent quantile, that gives me how many standard deviations do I go out to get to the upper or lower limit? So what would be probably more informative is to say, copy this up here and divide by that number. Because then the level plot here shows you the standard deviation. And then I don't have, then it's very informative, I would say. You could also do that in a different way by using predict with the option se.fit equals true, then you get exactly just the standard deviation for the confidence of the line, not for the prediction. This is for the predictions. If you did a comfort for the confidence instead, I, I should say that the noise I used for simulation has a standard error of 10. So that kind of explains the scale here. There's almost no uncertainty on the fit, all the uncertainty, because I have 400 observations. All the uncertainty is on the observations. Was that a question? This is one standard deviation, exactly. Okay, so that's uh, one thing you can do um, in case you have this in order to commu communicate how uncertain is your plot. A totally different thing that I, I'll create some other data take x to be uniformly distributed to get as much information uh, as I can in this case. And then I'll do a piecewise linear thing. So what I have here is that whenever x is above 4.5, then I add then the slope is too higher than the default of 0.5. So the slope here is 0.5 and then it's two and a half for the rest of this for the data. What I've done is then, rather than having to code this every time with a cut point and so forth, then I made a small function that's called PVL. And then I can use that actually in my regression with any breakpoint. It gives me which variable do I want to have a piecewise part for. And then I just fit the model. And then I will make some prediction data. I'll make the data frame in here. And it looks like this. Now I did not use the optimal breakpoint. I mean, I used seven as a breakpoint, and therefore the uncertainty looks much larger down here than it actually supposed to be. <coughs> it's not a good model. It is a model here. So what you'll typically want to do is to optimize this. So use the optimize function. 
then you have to specify a function that you want to optimize. And here I do it inline all together. So I take the residuals from the linear model with the set set as breakpoint. I square them and I sum them. And then I want to optimize in the interval from 3 to 8. And then the optimal value is 4.86, not too far away from the 4.5 that I used in my simulation. And let me just refit the model. Everything is significant. I'll add those lines as well. And you see that they are somewhat different, but still the 95% interval covers nicely the data that we wanted to be covered. Right? Now, how many degrees of freedom did I use in this model? As in, how many parameters did I estimate? Think of it for a short while. Then I think I'll... Are you ready to say a number? One, two, three. I'm happy that I heard the correct number. Why is the correct number four? You estimated in the linear model there's an intercept, there's an x for the slope, and then there's a piecewise linear that is a change in slope when you get above the breakpoint. That's three parameters. I was afraid that many of you would say three, so I'm happy. And then you estimated the breakpoint as well. That's a nonlinear optimization, so it's not totally fair to call it a linear model, so, but it takes one degree of freedom. Does it matter in this case? What does the fact that we estimated manually one extra parameter, how does that influence everything else that we're looking at here? Does it at all influence? The answer to that is yes. It does, but how much does it do? What happens? Do we have 97 degrees of freedom for the residuals? No, we have 96. Where is that number being used? It's used for when you have all the T statistics, all the T values there, in order to con to convert that to p-values, they use number degrees of freedom. I don't know how well you are in the t-distribution, but if you look at a t-distribution with 96 or 97 degrees of freedom, are they alike? Quite a bit. So it doesn't make. Let, let's just for the what we care about is the quantile for the 97.5 percentage to see how that differs. So if you look at the, do the same thing as before, QT of 0 0.975 and then we want it for the degrees of freedom to be 96 or 97, then we get two numbers out. Actually we probably need to look at the difference of that. So the difference is down to the fourth decimal point. So, really it doesn't matter that much in practice. Of course it's, I mean, we're using degree of freedom, but when you have many observations, it doesn't matter. It doesn't really influence much. So, even though it'd be c fair and correct to update that number in the linear model and do uh, change all the p-values and so forth, it really won't change anything dramatically. It's only the case where the t value you get here is in between those two numbers. That's the only case where your choice 
of reducing or not reducing will change. That was the main thing. Now I would, since we just made that image before, now there's, there's one more thing that I want to show. Um, And because some of you had a small problem here a while ago, did not get to clean the data file entirely. It's the ozone data that we looked at, I think, a long time ago, look at the tree model and so on. Just to remind you, you have the ozone at street level, have how much wind, temperature and radiation. We looked at a GAN plot to look at which nonlinear transformations to do. We looked at a tree plot to look at interactions and what is the most influential. and so on. Um, I'll skip the first bit here. Maybe I should, no, I'll just add, this was a model that we ended up doing last time and just plotting the diagnostic plot for this. It's not the best model in this case. Now you know more to do, probably transformation of the response as well to compensate for this down here. But now we'll just leave it as is. A good thing is always to plot the different predictors and then the residuals as a function of that. I did it as well uh, last week, but just want you to remind you of that. Um, so the temperature dependence is nonlinear, and then we did things down here. Now. The problem here is we have, oh, let's just fit this model as well. So this is the model that we have, let's plot it again. We should again consider transforming the response, um, but I won't get into that right now. It says there as a comment as well. Now, how do we plot the predictions from this? Before we looked at an image plot, in this model here, we had how I have three different predictors, temperature, wind, and radiation, and then some squared terms. So anyone in for looking at a 4D plot? No one? So we need to do something different, right? So what are the options? You can take one variable at a time and look at how does the response depend on that variable, or you can do a 2D plot as what you did before, where we only had two predictors. And then you have three different 2D plots, if you want to show them all, of course. What I will show you now is whenever you want to make a prediction, say we want to predict something for the wind speed. And we want to have the wind speed between 2 and say 22 meters per second. That's perfectly fine. Now, what I need to do is also then to pick a value for each of the other predictors. So, which value should I use? When the wind speed is 2 meters per second, what should I pick for the other predictors? So that's what I did in the code. <laughs> Indeed, let's see what happens when I do that. I'll create, calculate the prediction interval from the model. I'll make a plot where I look at first, I'll just add the points in here. And then I will add the prediction interval here. Ah. And the comment is, doesn't look too good. Now, can we figure out why that happens? I'll just calculate the correlation between the different variables. So, we use the average value for wind and for radiation for all values here. But in reality, if we look not just the cor correlation here, but also the pairs plot, We had that before. We're looking at the wind speed here and how that relates to ozone, that's fine, but 
how is the relation between wind and temperature and wind and radiation? We saw when we looked at the data the first time that temperature is the one that matters the most. So, but we have a correlation between temperature and wind. So when the wind is low, the temperature is generally high. And when the wind is high, the temperature is generally lower. That's the negative correlation of 0.5 here. So that would, we did not take that into account when we made the plot before. And that is part of the reason why things are somewhat misleading. So one thing you can do is instead of just using the mean values of the others, you can try to predict for this wind speed what is a good temperature. Basically, just to use wind as predictor for all the other predictors you need in the model. I made a small function that does that. Ah. Basically, the function takes some data, it takes what is your reference, what is the name of the reference, and what are the others where you want to have predictors for. By default, it will take all the other columns in your data set. And then you can say, which values do you want points for? And I just did take the minimum, take the, the default is to just take, go from minimum to maximum and make 30 points. And then we'll make a data frame that contains the prediction data frame that contains only reference. And then we'll take one at a time of the others. Then we'll make a linear model where it takes the other one as a function of the reference, fit that model, and just make a prediction of that. It corresponds to just using the linear relation between them. So as an example, for the ozone pollution, I will have reference wind, and then I'll mention just these two others, and I'll have the same numbers as before. So that means for every, o every wind speed, I get a reasonable radiation and temperature. And now you can see the temperature is not the same. So if, if I predict again, and I add lines to the other one, then now it's a little bit different. So it's a little bit further down, down here, and it's much slimmer up there, because we are at a different place in the data. So whenever you make predictions, and you have more variables than what you can present in your plot, you need to use sensible values for the others. And if predictors are correlated, you need to take that correlation into account. Does that make sense? Any questions? I will, of course, share all the code that I just ran, so you have it. Um, but these are just some pieces of information that you may or may not need. I mean, I'm sure you'll need some of it, but not, maybe not all of it for the second case when you get to that. So the other thing about the second case, you will get the data, the raw files, Friday afternoon. I think, I don't know if I wrote it in the program at 3 o'clock. I will share a pre-manipulated data set that has the correct number of flocks that are positive and negative in each week where you're supposed to do. Then you have something to compare it with what you did so far during tomorrow and Friday. But that also means you, you're safe to use that and instead of using your own data set. But if you're done with the analysis, you can get started on the main analysis as soon as you're done. So some of the steps there are removing a lot of observations and some are removing few observations. But that, that's uh, just one thing to mention. So that means that Friday afternoon, you always, all of you have something to work with that is sensible. And I think that's important. It also means, as I think I said that, do make a comparison, comparing this to your own. In this report, I do expect that you may want to make more plots. So that also means that the page count is probably going to be a little bit larger. Not so much larger text-wise, 
I would think, but maybe just including some five pages more of, of plots as a reference. Order of magnitude again, of course, it's not, I'd, I'd really dislike to give you a hard page count because then you, you all aim for using exactly that number of pages. I think, I don't know, let me just ask, in the report you made so far, your final conclusion, if you subtract the front page and maybe an index, if you have that, how many page, just mentally look at how many pages did you actually have in total in your report? That is, con that is real, the real content. Okay, let's, we'll do it the same way as before. We say just one, two, three, and you say the number. One, two, three. Seven, <laughs> Seven ten, eight were well, the numbers I heard um, most repeatedly. So basically, we're looking at something of the order of to 50. I mean, consider it's fine to, use, fine to use five pages more. Just not as a hard deadline. Any questions? I think I set the assignment to open at one o'clock, that's in five minutes. I will run out to a meeting that ends at two o'clock, hopefully. Then I'll just come by here for 10, 15 minutes in case there's something totally odd. And then I'll go home and read your first case and come back tomorrow when I'm done reading. So that means the meeting, I made one group tomorrow morning. I may or may not be there. If I'm not there, I'm reading.